Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again, speaking rather. And uh, I've been doing a series on the seven churches. And last time, just want to recap a bit, uh, we looked at the first church. This is in seven churches in Revelation. We're going to look at the second one in a minute. Um, but the first church, can you remember what it was called? Anybody? First church? Oh dear, perhaps it's a long time ago since I last spoke, so I'll have to remind you. Uh, the first of the seven churches is Ephesus, and we talked about losing your first love and how you can regain it. Um, and regaining your first love is a question of what Jesus said. He said to the church, remember the thing, repent first of all, remember the things you did at first. And then we looked at the things they did at first in Acts chapter 2. They dedicated themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Is it coming back to you a bit now? And so we dedicate ourselves to those things. And if we do that, we maintain our first love. We re regain it if we've lost it. So if you've lost your first love, just to recap, um, read the word, the Apostles' Doctrine, and really immerse yourself in it. It's easy these days. You can just on an app, you can put the Bible on and just listen to it wherever you like. And it's good to read the whole Bible in a year if you can. And uh, you get so much from that. And that just renews your first love you fall in love with the Lord again because it's his word it's his love letter um, and secondly your fellowship to be together not just on Sunday but as much as you can really of course if you're a family and you're busy it might be difficult to get together with others but um, as much as we can we mix together and fellowship and then breaking your bread we're eating in each other's houses taking the bread and the wine too and then last of all prayer a prayer is obviously important you're thinking why didn't that come first because the Lord wants us to really immerse ourselves in the other things and then prayer becomes really meaningful prayer encompasses praise and worship and all the other things that go with prayer so that was just a quick recap on the first church Ephesus and it's much very much a general word because the Lord appears to the first churches walking among uh, with the seven stars and walking among the seven candlesticks it's a very general word in in Revelation chapter 1, he talks about being the same. So the seven stars are the, are the, the, seven church, are the, apostles, sorry, are the leaders of the churches, effectively, and the seven candlesticks are the churches. So there's a very general word of, uh, to the Ephesians there. And the Ephesians was a, was a great church, as if you read it, but the Lord said, yes, but you, you've lost your first love, and I want my first love to be rekindled every day. That, that enthusiasm, and it's rekindled by doing those four things. In other words, doing what we did at first, reading the word, immersing ourselves in it, fellowshipping together as we did on Friday at uh, Manor's house. That was wonderful just to be together. And fellowship, you know, is as important as prayer because it's those four things. It doesn't say one was more important than the other. And uh, eating together. So all those four things, eat, prayer, uh, reading the word, fellowship, eating together, and prayer, and as we maintain those things, we dedicate ourselves to them, it says, then we, our first love's rekindled. And not only rekindled, we can go on to greater love. We can love him more and more. Uh, if you love the Lord already, then let's pray that you can love him more. I certainly would like to, every day, love Jesus more and love his people more. So let's fall in love with Jesus and his church more and more. So that was the first church. And we're going to look at the second church, which is Smyrna. And Smyrna is a very significant church. And hopefully we can get something on here. This is a new toy I've got. Let's see if it works. Is, is it, have you got it? Good. Excellent. It's going to work. Good. Excellent. Uh, so the first church is, uh, sorry, second church is Smyrna. And I want us to really think about this in terms of our own lives. The, the Bishop of Smyrna, the leader of Smyrna, at one point was called Polycarp. And he said something. He said, I, these 86 years I've served Jesus. Am I going to deny him now? These 86 years I've served him. Am I going to blaspheme against him now? And we'll see at the end what happened to Polycarp. Bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna comes from the same word. You know when they brought three gifts to Jesus? It was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, myrrh is Smyrna. So it's the Greek equivalent of. So this was a suffering church. And the word here is for the suffering church. And 
the Lord's writing to the angel of the church. We, the angel is an interesting expression. If you try and find out what it means, uh, then uh, there's lots of possible interpretations. So I think the main ones are, I is an angel. Amazing to think we might have an angel. Well, we have got an angel, I'm sure, assigned to our church. But also it's to, to the leader of the church, the, 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 the pastor, the one who cares for the church. And he says, these are the words are of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Now to Ephesus, he appeared, I've just said, as uh, walking amongst the seven golden candlesticks. Walking amongst the church is a very general word. This is a very specific word. He's, he's appearing as him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. So he's presenting himself as the first and the last, and the one who died and came to life again because it's a suffering church, and you'll see why in a minute why he presents himself like that. I know your afflictions and your poverty, but you are rich. Now, it was a very poor church because they were being persecuted. Uh, this is often taken to refer to the church from the time of the early church, from the time of the Bible, right through to Constantine. A suffering church. And we'll see a bit more of that in a minute and why it's taken as meaning that. The church, you're suffering and I'm suffering in some way. Is anybody not suffering this morning? Because we're in the world and Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, you will have suffering. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So we're on the winning side. Now we can either be participators or we can be spectators. And God wants us to be participators. If you're at a football match and you're watching and you're cheering them on, that's all very well and good, but... God wants you to say you're on Jesus' team. You want to get onto the football field and be on his team. And I want to be playing the game, not just the spectator. And the enemy is, is the enemy, and Jesus, I'm on his team. That's so important that we get on and we, we live the Christian life. Matthew 25, which Lorna read out, and when she read it, I thought, God, this is a long passage, but it's important for us to know this is the judgment day, and when we're being judged, we're going to be judged according to how we've been playing in the team. Have we been filled with enthusiasm? That's the first parable, was, if, you th if you remember, the five virgins, the five wise ones and five foolish. So it's the same thing as uh, he's saying to, uh, to Ephesus, really. Be full of love, enthusiasm, full of the Spirit. Basically, the oil that they were lacking or they had enough oil, was, was the, the spirit. The oil is the spirit. So you always, uh, that's an easy one to, to work out. So being filled with the spirit, being filled with joy, love, and uh, that's what Jesus is looking for. On the day of judgment, you see, Matthew 25 is the day of judgment. And I, whenever I read it every year, and I think, goodness me, and it really motivates you to, to participate. Get on the football field, not the football field, get on the you know, pitch of whatever it is, the field of battle against the enemy because we're in a fight. And if we don't get on the, on the field, then how are we going to produce fruit? Because the second of the, th the three parables in Matthew 25 is the talents. What, what, what have we been given? Are we a left back or a right back? Are we, a goal are we a, using the same analogy, a goalkeeper? Whatever we might be, uh, let's get on the field and do what we do. And let's use the talent that God's given us. Some may feel they've only got one talent, and some may feel they've, you know, gone to university and all those things and had lots of experience in life and got lots of talents. Well, use it, whether you've got one or lots. And the problem was, the people who think that they've not got much, they tend to do, say, well, I haven't got anything and, you know, I'm not worth... I wanted you to know this morning that each one of us is important in the body. Paul's very clear about that in Romans. Uh, it's very clear that each one of us, whether we're a little toe or a big toe, or whether we're a head or whether we're, we're not every, you couldn't do without your toes. The big toes, if you lose them, it's pretty difficult to, you know, it's pretty nasty to try and walk and run. But each of you are really important, and I might not feel I've got much talent, but I must use all that I've got because it's important for building the body. That's what the talent's for. Giving us a, a talent for building the body. I know about the slanders of those who are just moving forward because I want to make sure we get through the whole thing. I know about the slander of those who 
say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Interesting. We try and study this, and I'm trying to learn because it's really difficult, this one. Uh, you read what people are saying about this, and nobody's quite sure. I like it when nobody's quite sure because it means that we've all got to have a think, haven't we? Uh, God deliberately puts things difficult to understand in the scriptures, otherwise we say, oh, I understand that, and we forget about it, but if we, if we don't understand it, it makes us constantly think about it and say, well, what's that mean? Uh, why, is, why have you put that? Okay, I'll give you one or two of the main interpretations here. The slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. I'll give you the main one, I think. Um, it's normally, if you look at Jesus and uh, the, the Pharisees, he's always got a problem with them because they're trying to keep the law. They've always got a problem with him. Because, so he deliberately does things on the Sabbath. Have you noticed how often Jesus heals someone on the Sabbath? If you read through the scriptures, I don't know how many times, it must be six, seven times, he deliberately does it on the Sabbath and that annoys them so much because they think they shouldn't work. I know Lorna said to us recently that there was a student she had who was a very strict Jew and he didn't want those automatic lights, is that right Lorna? The automatic lights that switched on, you know, when you walk into a room, he didn't want them because uh, he said they was doing some work. On the Sabbath you're not supposed to work according to the really strict... Jew. And then that was the same in Jesus' time, but obviously that, that's, the, that's very extreme, isn't it? Um, so they were, they were brought, the lady uh, who had committed adultery and expected Jesus to say, yes, you should stone her because that's what the law said. And Jesus annoyed them by saying, him who is out of sin cast the first stone. And they healed on the, he healed on the Sabbath and said, well, isn't it good to do good on the Sabbath? challenging our attitudes because we can be so pharisaical as well so obviously in the church in Smyrna there are people who are very legalistic and I think that's the main way of interpreting this and the word here that Jesus uses is synagogue of Satan uh, so Satan is very much you know if you're legalistic or I'm legalistic it's the enemy if you feel in your mind attacked and I've mentioned this before because I, I get it you know you think you're not good enough, you think you're doing something wrong all the time, you're never quite right. Anybody feel that? Well, you, we're sort of, I was going to say barking up the wrong tree, but I can't think of the right expression. We're, uh, we're on the wrong page. We're, that's not what the Christian life is about. We're free from the law. We're free from the law of sin and death. We don't live the life sort of like trying to make sure every single detail is correct. And if I try and do that, it just stunts you completely, doesn't it? We've got to have the freedom, the freedom of expression. Free. Jesus says he makes us free. He would say who sets, the sun sets free is really free, or free indeed. You're really free if you're a Christian. And I think this is probably the best interpretation of this, because it's always the case that you see what happened to the Galatians, that they were trying to get them... No, uh, some people were trying to get people to be circumcised as if you keep the old law of the Jews but Jesus has set us free from all of that Paul's very clear there's neither Greek, Jew nor Greek slave nor free they're all one in Christ we're all one in Christ and it's so important the fellowship that we have the importance of fellowship just being together and loving one another and not judging one another you know how easy it is. That, so you come out of the world, and I come out of the world, and the world's thing is about judging and comparing and, you know, being like somebody, oh, well, I'm a better or worse, and, you know, uh, what about the clothes you wear, all that kind of thing, and you look at someone's clothes, and you... That's the world. The spirit of the Lord is totally different. Totally different. Opposite. Sometimes we don't acknowledge that it's the opposite. Now we come into a kingdom that's the opposite. It's, it's like darkness and light. We've come into the light. We, we don't judge people anymore. We don't keep looking at them, comparing ourselves. Am I better or worse? You know, the same talk about the body earlier on, or the one with one talent or ten talents. Don't think you're worse because you've got one talent. Just use it. Don't think about your comparison with somebody else. And don't try and be first. You know, Jesus is very strong on that, isn't it? That the first should be last and the last first. We should never try, to always try to be a servant and serving everybody like a shepherd. You see, the word pastor is shepherd, isn't it? It's not someone who's got a position necessarily. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you 
and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. Suffering, just relating it to us again, uh, you know, let's not be afraid of the suffering we go through, but say, God, we've got the victory in this. And what the Lord's saying here is, you know, we, we will be persecuted. And around the world today, obviously, there's Christians, um, you say, a lot more persecuted than us. But we still feel persecuted. We still feel, you know, if we mention Jesus' name at work or whatever it might be, it wouldn't be a good idea because uh, once they've labelled us as a Christian, then it's like we're marked people. We're always being watched from then onwards. You know, it doesn't take a lot for people to know you're a Christian anyway. It's quite surprising. You say nothing and they'll still think you're a, they'll still recognise it. You don't really have to say that much. Even if you say, God bless you, that's enough. Or whatever you might do. You know, evangelism is very much a question of witness first. Polycarp, who was the first bishop of Smyrna, may, may, I don't know if he was the first, but he was bishop of Smyrna at this time, um, he wrote a letter, I was found out this week, he wrote a letter to the, Ephes to the Philippians, and his letter to the Philippians was beautiful, so gentle, so kind, he was praising them to start with, saying how good it was to see their faith. It's not part of the Bible, by the way, if, uh, if you're trying to look for it. So you won't find the Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. It's a beautiful letter. And interestingly, he referred to Peter, what Peter said. He quoted Peter, he quoted Paul, he quoted John, and he added nothing himself. He said, this is wonderful scripture. That's really good, actually. Wonderful scripture, and Paul's amazing, and it's just worth reading maybe once just to see what it's like. But that was the character of Polycarp, a very humble sort of person. We'll see what happens to him at the end. And because this is a, a church where you shouldn't be afraid, it says, of the suffering. The devil will put some in prison. We heard in Matthew 25 that one of the things we should do is visit people in prison. I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus is specifically referring to visiting Christians who are in prison for their faith at the time. But we should visit people in prison generally. I think that's what you, there's many great things that are happening in prison where people uh, meet the Lord in prison. It's very common. They reflect on their life. And of course, they do alpha courses in prison. Um, and uh, a lot of fruits born in prison. So certainly pray for those in prison, if you know somebody who's there. Uh, and pray that they'll come to know the Lord and, and, and visit maybe. Maybe that's going to be a ministry that you have. I know that in our church in Kilmouth, they have a, a big prison ministry. Uh, and that's really great because there's such a lot of fruit born from that. And you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. And the 10 days, again, it's one of those things that people we get various interpretations. I quite like the one of the ones that says it's, there were 10 emperors who persecuted most of all from the, t the early church right through to Constantine. Um, by the way, we're going to look at Constantine in the next church, which is the church of Pergamos. Uh, Pergamos has significance, it means marriage. And uh, for those who know a little bit, you'll see and you may know already, I'm learning all the time, so we're all learning. Um, but the uh, there's 10 days could be the 10 main persecutions between the early church. Nero, we know about, don't we? Domitian, you may have heard of, two of the main persecutors. Nero, what did he do? He threw Christians to the lions. Domitian tried to stamp out the church. And the more you tried to stamp it out, the more it kind of like grew. And somebody said, as I, I read somebody saying that by the time of Constantine, about half the Roman Empire were Christian. So were, however much they're trying to stamp it out, it just came up and, and grew and grew and grew. It's almost like persecution causes growth. They say that in the countries around the world where there's most persecution, there's most growth. Um, so it could be the case. Whenever we read things on the internet, by the way, and I was talking with Lorna earlier that... Uh, I go to Wikipedia quite a bit because you think, well, maybe Wikipedia is pretty unbiased because people um, you know, edit it and all that kind of thing. And uh, you're aware, though, that maybe you've got, you might get something wrong reading Wikipedia and you really don't know. I'll tell you what, read the Bible. You know that's okay. And, and then compare what you read with the Bible. That's probably the best thing to do. That's what I try and do. Um, and Lorna was saying in the scientific side, she doesn't, doesn't really trust Wikipedia at all. So there we go. For someone who nearly understands her, her profession, I mean, she doesn't recommend Wikipedia. So be a bit careful. But, you know, who do you trust? Well, we trust the Bible. 
Um, we hope we try and trust others as well, but we trust the Bible uh, that the Word of God is true, and we compare everything with it. So let's see where we, go to, where we get to next. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you your victor's crown. Now, whatever your suffering is, mental, a lot of us have, in our society, more and more mental suffering apparently, and if you're suffering mentally, just think back to what I said before about um, the enemy is always trying to accuse. You know, he's always trying to accuse the brethren, day and night. It says that in the Bible. He's the deceiver. He's always trying to deceive you. And if you're thinking, well, I haven't, why haven't I got very far in life? Well, there's an enemy trying to deceive and he's trying to hold you back all the time. If you're a Christian, he's really against you. He's against people in the world too. He's just a... You know, I was going to mention one or two rulers that we know in the world today, but he's worse than that. Um, in the past, Hitler, the enemy is worse than that. I mean, these people are so evil, aren't they? You can't. How can there be such people so evil in the world? There's an enemy who's extremely evil, and he is trying to hold you back. And if you feel inadequate, you feel you're a failure. Who's saying that to you? It's not God. He's like a papa, a daddy. He's not saying that, he's saying the opposite. Come on, come on, you can walk. You know, when he's a young child, you can walk, come on, you can make it. And if you fall over, don't worry, get up, you can walk. He's trying to encourage, that's Jesus. So if you hear voices in your head, thinking, you sure you failed again, you've done it again. God isn't like that, he's trying to pull you up. If you read his word, that's going to help, put good thoughts in your brain. Nothing better than reading God's word and putting good thoughts in your brain. In the early in the morning, read the whole Bible through as much as you can, more than once. Honestly, if you do that, your brain and you call it, see the world calls it brainwashing. <laughs> I, I love what J. John said. He said uh, when he came home, he was converted, and uh, he said, "Mum, I've become a Christian. You've been brainwashed." He said, "Mum, if you knew what my brain was like before, you'd be really glad it's been washed." Uh, probably the best thing to say with people is, well, all right, you let the world come over you all the time. They're going to wash you with their stupidity. I'm not saying everything in the world is stupid, but you know what I mean. The enemy will certainly wash your brain with bad things. You want brain washed with God. And, uh, you know, the washing of the word. It's a spiritual expression, scriptural expression. Let your brain be washed by the word of God. Time and time again, every morning, Every morning, every evening, when you're lying in bed and going to sleep, put the Bible on in the background. It's, it's amazing how good it is for your, for, your, for your brain, you know. It's incredible listening to it through. It does so much good. If you're struggling, then the so first thing I'd recommend is to do that. If your brain is struggling, you, you know, mentally, don't fix on one or two scriptures. Just see the whole thing through. It's much better to have a, a good diet than just live off vegetables or meat or whatever you live off. It's much better to have a, a comprehensive diet of the whole Word of God. And some bits are difficult to chew on, aren't they? Some bits of the Bible, they're really hard to chew on. You know, you go through uh, Job, for instance. But if you go through Job, and recently I've been listening through Job, and I've been thinking, you know, this is really good because it shows you how much this guy suffered and how much people try to judge him. You know, you suffering, it must be your fault. That's what they were basically saying. And but you get pages of it, you think this is really boring. But I think it, it really establishes the fact that if you're suffering, it's not because you've done something wrong. I know that that obviously does happen too. But the general thing you've got to think of is don't think you're suffering because you've done something wrong. That's what Job's all about. whole huge book on it. So God's put that in there to tell you that if you think why are you suffering? Not because you've done something wrong. And then you can start thinking, well, perhaps God is on my side after all. And that's encouraging, isn't it? Be faithful unto the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Isn't that beautiful? I'll give you life as your victor's crown. You know, we've got eternal life. And the world is kind of like shouting, and said, what's that all about? Uh, <laughs> And the, but if you read the word all the time, you're going to get filled with the truth and you're going to believe more and more. A lot of believing is to do with reading the word. And Lorna read Matthew 25 hours earlier, a long chapter. But we need you know, to be patient. If you want to read the whole Bible through in a year, 
It's only 15 minutes a day. Can you manage that? Get up 15 minutes earlier. Listen to 15 minutes of the Bible. Or if you go through the Bible in one year, like we're doing at the moment, and really love it, it takes you 30 minutes, because Nicky Gumbel commentates on it. And to me, that's wonderful. I just like to hear what he's got to say. And he said he, he, he composed his, it through the notes he took in the Bible over the years, and he's just sort of put it all together. But you may have your own system that's better. But I want to encourage you, read the word every day, get brainwashed, because your brain needs washing. Mine does anyway. And it really helps so much when I've got stupid thoughts in my brain to just shove the Bible on, listen to it while I'm going to sleep. And it, it does its work. It's God's word. And Lorna reading out that, it made us really think about the judgment day, didn't it? And gosh, you know, is that what's going to happen to me? And is Jesus really going to separate out? Wow, I better do something about it. That's what happens to me every time I read that chapter. I think, wow. And... We're going to finish off with a song from that because I, I decided I wanted to write a song that went with the sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats you know, was the last bit that Lorna read out. And the sheep and the goats was, uh, you know, you, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. Interesting that one because we get lots about healing in the New Testament. But don't think someone's... Uh, done something wrong because they're sick just visit them love them and pray and, and do lay hands on them this morning's reading we were reading uh, about laying hands it was the end of Matthew's gospel and it made me think we really need to lay hands on the sick more often because it's really key to, to, to healing so he, Nicky Gumbel said the main way uh, in the Bible that, that uh, the sick are prayed for is by laying on hands. So I want to encourage a bit more of that. Certainly me, it encourages me, it has me if you think we don't lay hands, I don't lay hands on people enough. In the, I think mainly in the midweek meetings and then maybe on the Friday as well, we could lay hands on people when they're not well and, 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 and you end up prophesying and praying for them as well very often. Um, so we need to come to the end now and I hope that's been helpful to you. It's helped to remind me as I've been thinking about it and during the week as I've been preparing uh, that if we're suffering, then it's not your fault. But you're encouraged by Jesus through these words. Whoever hears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. There's an encouragement in all, in all these seven churches to just hold on. You know, listen, listen. So all the seven churches are for, today, for us today. Whoever has ears, have you got ears? Listen and to what the Spirit says to the churches. And in this case, it's very encouraging for those who are suffering. So if you're suffering this morning, or you know someone who's suffering, pray for them. Don't judge them. Don't judge yourself, in one sense. Although we should, you know, take the beam out of our own eye. First of all, look at yourself, say, God, have I done anything wrong? But if the enemy is constantly accusing you, constantly bombarding your mind, and you just cannot get your mind clear, read the Word of God lots. Say, Lord, I know you're encouraging me. Encourage me more. And he says to you, well, then read my Word. I'll encourage you if you read my Word. That's how Jesus mainly encourages, by the way. Go through the whole thing in a year. It doesn't take that much time. Can you manage the 15 minutes a day? Maybe you do it already, so I'm talking to the converted, but um, lots of you do, I'm sure. But it's tremendous to do that because it really changes you and you fall in love with Jesus again. More and more and more. And the more you read the Bible, the more you fall in love with Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. It's wonderful to know that if we're suffering, it's not our fault. Lord, the enemy is so strong and so clear clearly ad accusing us day and night and we just want to be on on the team lord that fights for the truth lord have mercy on us lord that we would be your disciples and your followers in jesus name amen